Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's BOFAS Lecture of Distinction on Posterior, Malleolus and Beyond. My name is Yasser Ghani and I'll be your moderator tonight. Uh, tonight's speakers are uh, Mr. Malloy and Professor Mason uh, from Liverpool uh, University Hospitals. Thank you to Ramsey Healthcare for sponsoring tonight's lecture. Uh, just a couple of notes, please submit your questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, attendance certificates for CPD will be issued following your submission for feedback. Uh, and as usual, you should receive an automated feedback email after logging out of tonight's broadcast. Uh, if you don't receive the automated email in the next 24 hours, please use any of the previous links and then uh, use the new code in the Zoom chat. Um, Tonight's speakers need no introduction. They are internationally renowned for their foot and ankle work. The distinguished speakers are Mr. Andy Malloy, Senior Foot and Ankle Consultant and Honorary Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Liverpool. And Professor Lyndon Mason, who was awarded the Ontarian Professorship in 2019 for his work on ankle fractures. So without further ado, uh, over to Mr. Mason and Mr. Malloy. Thanks, yes, sir. and thanks to both us for putting this on. It's a, a delight for the two of us to talk again. Uh, um, we obviously gave a talk on posterior malleolar fractures last year, which is obviously available on the BOFAS website. So for any of the background to it, that's there. So what we're going to do today is really as a fireside chat to talk through cases a little as you would do in a trauma meeting or in a foot and ankle MDT meeting. So we can get to some of the slightly, I suppose, esoteric points, but also how how these cases can be slightly different each time and what our decision making process is. So I'll ask Lyndon uh, about the first case, really. So, Lyndon, this is a posterior malleolar fracture, uh, which is uh, immediately stable on this weight bearing radiograph. How would you, how would you further investigate this? Yeah, so, so it would be quite uh, regular to come into clinic with a weight bearing radiograph. And this is obviously a weight bearing radiograph with a posterior malleolar fracture. Now, we do have an increasing number of posterior malleolar fractures. We have treated conservatively that were undisplaced. But to know it's undisplaced, we would need to get a CT scan. So my initial uh, uh, investigation uh, after this would be a CT scan. But you can see on this one already that on the lateral, the talus is already slightly subluxed posteriorly, and we have displacement of this posterior malleolar fracture. So I mean, how big do you think the posterior malleolar fracture is? No idea. And that's the truth. And I've, uh, like yourself, Andy, I've looked at thousands of these and I still don't have a clue on these x-rays of how big the posterior malleolar fracture. Um, a percentage is a uh, unknown entity on these radiographs. We, um, just to label that point, obviously we, uh, there's nine papers in the uh, literature showing that the posterior malleolar fractures uh, can't be really viewed on your x-rays. So, uh, some people saying 22%, so only one-fifth, you'll know how big the fracture is. And obviously, we've done our own paper on this, uh, be it it's not published yet, it's been presented, and it's been presented in BOA this year, uh, showing that if you are actually going to look at the morphology of the our classification system, you can get down to only 24%, 17%, especially the rotational pylons are the worst ones uh, with this, that you just don't know what type of fracture is. So you can think the type ones, for example, are type three. So even the, the very small fractures can look like a big fracture or the very big fractures can look like a small fracture. So we just don't know. Uh, so yeah, so this is, this is the CT scan for this one. Yeah, so I mean, I think, as you said, it's 2A and 2B, which you can mix up with the other types. There's just no way of telling. Um, so, what difference does that really make for subluxation and things? So, so there's a biomechanical paper that came out last year showing that the, the rotational pylons um, are rotationally unstable. So we didn't know this. Obviously, when we started this work five years ago, the Haraguchi classification thought these were all um, avulsion fractures. But you can see with this one, it's a rotational pylon, but you can see that we subluxed. And 
Uh, this paper uh, came out last year showing that you can actually quantify the subluxation on these CTs also. The, um, so for, we've published about our treatment algorithm before. So, I mean, how would you approach this one? So, so this is, I guess, the uh, Blue Peter, this is how I did it earlier, I guess, uh, situation. But you can see that the, your fib the fibula plate has been put on posteriorly, and I've uh, um, also fixed the uh, posterior malleolar fracture through the same incision. So this is the, our, obviously our algorithm. And for this one, a two-way, we typically would do a postural approach. So this one has been done as per algorithm, I guess. Uh, and obviously this is based on, on our paper that came out in foot last year. Do you want to talk about this paper, yeah. Andy? So I think, I mean, we, we, we've had this published, but I actually think it, it, it's almost the best bit of work after the classification system, because it really leads you to why, what approach should be used. And it really is just what can be visualized. It's not that we have a preference for doing one over the other, but if you look at this clock face, essentially this was done on cadaveric specimens from making each approach, putting K wires in to uh, take the uh, soft tissues as far apart as they could do, and how much can you see? So you will see a lot of papers out there saying that they just use one approach for it. But from what we showed is that you just can't get to all parts of different fractures from one approach. And this is... Right. Uh, they obviously didn't like what I was saying, um, but it is. Um, yeah. So it's just it's absolutely critical if you're going to address each part of the fracture to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to to follow the algorithm based on what we showed. So, I mean, the other thing with that is that how do you position these patients? Will you position them the same way? Do so, so I. I... So I don't, I don't know what you felt. So, um, so this is a, a based on that paper. You can see the different bits through each bit. Um, and you can see the postural approach. You can see the, the fragments of your 2A here. But your type 2B, for example, you can't see that through the postural, which is why you need other incisions. But I started them all with this prone position, which was, uh, so this is two sheets, one on top of the other. In between them, we have a Montreal mattress. And then we've dropped the leg out of the way the other leg, and this is obviously the, the injured leg. And then we put a sandbag underneath this to tilt the pelvis back, but otherwise you, you'll, you'll tilt towards the, um, the dropped leg side. So this was my go-to way, uh, but uh, when I had a anaesthetist that was uh, the same anaesthetist all the time, this was uh, very easy to do. But I must say I've migrated much more now to this recovery position prone where the top half is lateral because the, uh, the anaesthetist number one uh, I uh, preferred it, especially if the anaesthetists are not that happy with the prone position. And also in the, the bigger patients, the patients they're worried about uh, going prone, it's much easier to do. But to, to do this, you have to do a bad side down lateral to start with. So you turn the patient laterally and then you take the leg and keep on moving the leg till it's uh, in this uh, Aquinas position. Uh, but the top half with some lateral supports remain in this recovery position. So it, it, it doesn't quite show up on this, but the, the important thing with this is that the, the, the torso isn't quite fully lateral, but is in a sort of sloppy lateral position, sort of partially facing down. And the, the, I think, as Lyndon said, the key that this is made is that just going standard prone if you're doing a postural lateral uh, approach is absolutely great. But if you need to do anything to the anterior part of the medial malleolus, trying to get to it by the prone position or bending the leg up into the air and having to do things upside down and the wrong way around is really difficult. And this makes everything a lot easier. So uh, as you'll all know, is that the key to any of these procedures is fixing a fracture is fixing a fracture. It's just putting a plate and some screws on it. It's actually getting the approach right and the position right so you can see what you want and you can decrease your stress levels as well as the anaesthetist. Are we just moving on to case two? Yeah, Andy, I'll grill you on this one if that's okay. I think it's one of your cases. So this is a, obviously a, a very displaced fracture uh, with the talus has gone posture lateral, very comminuted fibula. So uh, I'm assuming you want further investigations? Yeah, so, so when you look at this, obviously it's a very low fibula fracture. Um, 
is gross displacements and he can't it's posteriorly sublux but we can't see the posterior malleolus at all so there must be some injury at the back but i'd also point you on the ap that just in line with the lateral cortex of the fibula there is uh, like a, a double white shadow there now one of the things that we've found is this always means that there's a significant wagstaff fracture present so yeah obviously we get a ct scan on this and thankfully it being a little better reduced by this point. So you can see there that it's a 2A posterior malleolar fracture. But when we go through to the, um, uh, to the uh, uh, next views, as you can see how large that Wagstaff fracture is off the top. Now, with uh, this is the 3D CT. So you can see that's a significant fragment off the front. Now, one of the other bits of work that we, did when we first did it was about the amount of uh, 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 um, what was unstable in the syndesmosis. So by fixing the 2A back on is that you'll fix the PITFL back on. But what we found is for different types of fractures is that there were uh, differing levels of either just posterior instability or full syndesmotic instability. So that really is, was just the PITFL injured or was the AITFL and the syndesmotic membrane uh, 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 injured as well? And you can see that on the type ones, full syndesmotic injury was uh, really the most prevalent thing. And this decreased as we went through it. But for these type twos, such as that one that we've just shown, is that uh, almost a third of those had full syndesmotic instability. So you'll need to check carefully uh, 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 for that. And if you see on, on the anatomical uh, 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 specimen here is the three parts that you can, that you can injure and that we need to make sure that it's not just the back that's gone off that we haven't taken off AITFL either with or without some big bony fragments and the syndesmosis uh, membrane as well. And then when we done this paper on the posture, posture medial aspect as well, and the well, one thing that amazed me was the larger the fragments, the, the less chance that you had instability of the syndesmosis is that is a either bone or ligament. So if the ligament went, it was less bony injury, and if if the bone went, it was less ligament injury. Yeah, I mean, my feeling, and there's no way we've got of, of really proving this, but in, in in my simple mind, it just sort of felt that the the larger the bony fragment was, is that means that that the force has been transmitted through there as opposed to the rest of the syndesmosis, which I don't know whether that makes sense or not, but it did seem to correlate in our uh, uh, in our in our study. Now, uh, do you want to talk about the size of the Wagstaff fragments? Yes, yeah, so, and that, and because that are correlated with this as well, is that the uh, the larger fragments didn't necessarily uh, correlate with the syndesmotic injury either uh, with, the, with the Wagstaff. So the smaller fragments were, could still have a syndesmotic injury and the larger fragments sometimes didn't. The thing to take home from this is, is that like, you want to go and fix your posterior malleolar fracture back on, but you must keep on assessing the, uh, the rest of the syndesmosis. So, so with this one, we initially fixed the, fixed the, uh, the, the back to start off with. So um, if you put your lateral place on, first of all, is you, you won't see the posterior malleolus fracture. So you need to get this. And once you've got that, in the correct position is almost always your fibula is going to be out to length. So fix that with uh, one screw at this time, although we've changed with some other plates now, um, and then fix the fibula. And then if you look from this sort of AP view, once we've, once we've fixed it, is that we still have that large uh, uh, Wagstaff fragment. Now, if it's a smaller one and your plate will allow it, is that you can suture it back down or use intraosseous sutures, but this one was big enough uh, 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 to allow for a 2.7 uh, screw. But even after fixing the wag stuff down, as the syndesmosis membrane wasn't quite intact, as it just felt like it was giving slightly. So we put a syndesmosis screw through there as well. And then uh, we've got some, we always uh, uh, tend to follow up our complex ankle fractures for, for six months. So this is a six month, month uh, x ray, which quite pleasingly doesn't, doesn't show any uh, increase in uh, arthritis radiographically. Great. Uh, so uh, case three. So um, for, what, 
what type of fracture would you say this would be? See if you can guess on this one, <laughs> whether you can remember or not. Uh, yeah, so go through. Obviously, we've got this double shard immediately, which uh, usually means that it's a, it's a 2B fracture. So obviously, we can only see one fragment on the lateral. But on the AP, if you've got this double shard, are you thinking that you've got a spitting out of that 2B fracture? So and that's obviously you're just trying to get Lyndon to show that he's clever. But the thing that's important with that is that obviously most of us, or pretty much all of us, only have fluoroscopy when we're fixing it. But when you get an AP view, if you can still see a double shadow, this hasn't been reduced properly. And we'll come on to that a little bit later. So what type of fracture is this? And uh, what approach? So, so, we, so, the, so this is, this is uh, a lot more complex than, uh, especially outside of our algorithm. And the reason for that is that not only got the 2B fracture, but you've got this comminuted anterior collicular fracture making a, a Y-shaped medium malleolus. But also you have this uh, high fibular fracture, which is really difficult to treat a high fibular fracture with a posterolateral approach. But in my hands, I find it is. So it means that like, so our, our algorithm, uh, so it has to change a little bit for this one because of the high fibula and also this uh, comminuted medium malleolus. Uh, so, this is uh, the, the posterior aspect. Um, so if you just go through to the next slides for, for us, that obviously shows that the, the syndesmosis doesn't look too happy, but are there any problems that you can foresee in fixing this 2B fracture? And how, how would you approach it? Which bit do you do first? So with this one, the, um, you're, due to what we found with this, uh, as I said, uh, compression of the, of the postural lateral aspect causes a medial translation of the medial side. Is that if we do the lateral side first, unfortunately, we're going to have a malreduction. Well, we, we found that with some of our early cases, you're more likely to malreduce your medial side. So the medial side is usually the easiest one to approach first uh, to get that large chunk back. And that was what we did. Also, bringing your, your medial postural medial approach more anteriorly towards the, the front um, allows you to get to the anterior collicular fracture. And so um, I think the key point you say there is that it's an extensile approach, so you can keep on going up and keep on going down. I'm sure we'll talk about that, that later a bit. So uh, do you want to show your final handiwork? So as you can see here, we, we have a plate on the, on the posture medial side, uh, keying in that, uh, the, the apex of that medial fracture. Uh, we have that small uh, 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 screw, the headless screw here in that very small anterior collicular fracture. The fibula has gone on laterally because that's much easier to fix your uh, high fibula. And that means that you can actually put your finger across and get in uh, to reduce and uh, fix this percutaneously, this postural small fragment, which has meant that we, this one has been done percutaneously. And as you said, I mean, this was a, uh, a, a case that we did together, wasn't it? But it was, uh, that fibula was an absolute pig to get reduced. Yeah. So don't think you've got everything solved when you've just done the back is actually the most challenging part of this is, is that, that high fibula with the big butterflies, they're difficult to get out to, to length. So I think that's the thing, it's just crucial that you ensure, we ensure that we get. Thank you. So case four. Uh, so, um, uh, Yasa, do you have any questions? Could we go yeah, through? so I'll just chip in. Um, uh, please, the audience, if you have any questions, uh, just channel them through and I'll keep asking them uh, after a few cases. Uh, so that's a brilliant three cases. Now, there is one question, uh, which I think probably is, you've described in case one, a posterior malleolar fracture. Uh, but what about the short tendon rotated distal fibula, which wasn't commented on? Presumably you fix this too, and I think you have probably answered this anyway, that you will go on and fix this. So we, yeah, so we, we only fix the, we fix the posture, uh, posture malleolar fracture first, just because otherwise you can't see your reduction on your, when you fix the fibula. So as soon as you fix the fibula, the plate's in the way. But sometimes, uh, especially if the fracture is two, three weeks old, it's actually quite useful to get a reduction on the fibula first with a, with a clamp to get, because it's much easier to bring that, the posture mal down with bringing the fibula down to with a reduction and then putting a uh, fixation on the posture mal before then putting the plate on the fibula. And sometimes it's much easier to do both together than, than to take down. Otherwise you can commonly the posture lateral 
fragment uh, by trying to bring that down uh, by itself. Excellent. And then that follows on. So the other thing would be then, do you have any tri tips or tricks when you actually have to do uh, the fibula fixation first? How do you visualize your appropriate reduction of the posterior mal then? So it, it depends what type of posterior mal it, it is. So for example, if it's a type three, you can visualize your reduction uh, through a medial posterior medial approach, because that's where the corner of the fracture is, for example. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, have to do a, um, the fibula first, I would generally put uh, some clamps on wires to provisionally fix it without putting the plate on and then fix the fix so you can visualize and then actually put the plate on. Yeah, so I must admit, I, I feel the same is that if it's an older fracture, which unfortunately seems to be happening more commonly just because we're slightly inundated, um, is that if there's some early callus and fibrous tissue, you, you just trying to get the posterior malleolar fracture, which will be slightly osteopenic at this stage, is really difficult. So just take the fibula down as you would do. And if you want to try and aid it, as Lyndon said, is I, I find a 1.6 or 2 millimeter wires just going across the incisura or even into the talus is just really helpful to get them down. And it doesn't get in the way of you visualizing that you've got the posterior malleolar fracture down. So you can, you can see it directly, obviously, but it's always more difficult if there's been some comminution that's partially re resolved, is you need to be able to get a true lateral x-ray. So it's one thing to always check at the start is that with the radiographer that you can get a decent view. Excellent, all right. Uh, I think we should move on to the other cases then. Uh, so th this is a, um a ankle injury which has uh, widening the medial clear space, widening the syndesmosis and this tiny, tiny little fragment, be it that the CT sh has shown this to be a tiny fragment as well. So and when they've had a weight burn view, you, uh, it's actually shortened. So it, it's, uh, it's achesally unstable. So I amazing nerve fracture, which is achesally unstable. So, I mean, I think one of the important things with this is that you've got a weight-bearing x-ray on the uh, 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 on the rise of the ankle, but obviously with the back slab on, it's not a weight-bearing x-ray of the knee. And so you won't always see the shortening that is apparent there. But if the fibula looks short, is that we do tend to use a lot of tightrope, and they, they, they work really excellently, but they don't provide any axial or very little axial stability. And that's been commented on in all the bigger series and the biomechanical papers that they've done. So if you think it's a fibula that is at risk of shortening, is that you need something that's gonna be robust and resisting axial movement. So um, for these, as well as if you are gonna use screws as well, and I'm not aware of any study that's been done on, with a tightrope, is that, uh, some friends of mine from Fellowship, uh, Kanaki and, uh, and Espinosa did a, a study where they showed that the, the strongest uh, uh, construct is to use a two or three hole plate, but your syndesmosis fixation through. So this is what we went and did on, on, on this case, where we just one screw is necessary. Um, and uh, we can, if we have time at the end, we can have a debate about whether you should take syndesmosis screws out or, or not. Um, but if you are going to take them out is I'd leave them in for at least four months. But if you do take it, this syndesmosis screw out, you've still got a tight rope and you're not worry, as worried about leg failure and the axial problem will have gone by then, so it will have united. And this is the patient uh, at, uh, at six months. Now this one hasn't obviously been removed. So I, I talked about this on, the, on my lecture distinction last year on syndesmosis fixation. Um, and so the pros and cons of, of tight ropes and screws. Uh, this one, just to add in, is one that uh, I've added in just because uh, of this. When you do reduce it, and you, uh, again, this was on the lecture last year, and you have this obvious, uh, the fibula looks quite posterior. So this is, a, this is a true lateral. And the fibula is a good uh, four or five mil away from what is this, the corner of the profonde. This, I would be worried about a posterior subluxation. And actually, I did actually open the anterior aspect of syndesmosis for this, and it was posterior subluxed. And therefore, I brought it uh, forward, and this one was actually stable, uh, which is quite rare for these type of cases. Uh, and it has had a um, uh, two tight ropes. So, as with the 
saying there is that you, you do your standard lateral approach to the fibula, but you just go over the top. Now, obviously, you, AITFL probably has gone, but you don't want to be cutting, uh, cutting into that too much. But you can just see that as you tighten your tight ropes up, that it just it seats within the incisura so that you know that it's correctly reduced. Uh, if it, you found that it wasn't and it, you couldn't play around with another tightrope is that you can always cut them out and put another one in. Uh, and that's a slightly expensive way of, uh, of doing that. So is there any way that you'd assess this limb in interopsy, whether you think the deltoid is ruptured or? Yeah, so, so this is a something, again, it's a work in progress, definitely. Uh, but I started getting quite concerned that I was seeing these patients coming back with flattening feet. Uh, I don't know what you, you felt. You've you got a, um, a longer experience than me, Andy, but so I, I just felt they were coming back to clinic and they were flattening. So I was ending up having to give them uh, insoles. Functionally, they were doing okay, but they, they were getting flatter. So interop, I started doing this test where, as, so this is one which you can see as Addison's modic uh, stability, uh, as the actually stable ankle. And then when you bring the foot, so the hind foot instability across, you can see the calcaneus has now moved a good centimeter and syndesmosis, sorry, the, the deltoid, uh, superficial deltoid which is attached to your tussin tackle and tail eye has opened up significantly. And these are the ones I've started to get really worried about uh, um, deltoid injuries and therefore repairing the superficial deltoid. And obviously the, the, the paper that came out uh, uh, last year, uh, published this year now, um, showed that uh, TMTJ instability, spring ligament instability was all uh, at uh, uh, a consequence of this superficial deltoid injury. Yeah, so I mean, the, there's some really good anatomical uh, uh, studies by, there's one, but I think originally it was done by uh, Basistas at, uh, at Al in 2018, and it was repeated by Jerry O'Kane. And there, there are three slips that come off. Um, from superiorly in, uh, in forming the spring ligaments. So I think it's your, uh, your tibio navicular, your tibial spring and your tibio calcanea. So I just would always be concerned that there is some injury to those. And when you, when you go in, there's a big, usually a big cleavage there. It's all the way off. And you can, you can if you uh, take the, the hind foot, you can move it. You can really, really move it like into a flat foot position. And by putting these anchors in, you just, you put a, one anchor in your medial malleolus, bring one through your uh, spring ligament, one through your uh, calcaneal medial uh, malleolar ligament. And then if you just lift it, you can feel the, me the hind foot swing back into a normal position. And you just tie it up. It's a very simple repair. Okay, so then, yeah, do you have any questions on that one, Yasser? Yeah, so we've got, um, yeah, we've got one question coming, which is from uh, Matt Philpot. Do we need to use a clamp? when fixing the syndesmosis, or is it okay just to hold the foot dorsiflexed? So the, holding the foot dorsiflexed will actually open your syndesmosis rather than close your syndesmosis because your talus is wedge-shaped. It's a, it's a uh, consequence of our evolution is that we, to become bipedal, we have to have a, an ankle essentially sat and didn't dorsiflex too much. And like monkeys who climb trees who have very square tie leg, we had to have one that was wedge-shaped. So as it's coming up into that wedge, it naturally causes your uh, rotation of your fibula. So if your fibula is uh, unstable, as you bring your foot up into extreme dorsiflexion, you will actually widen your syndesmosis. Uh, in regards to a clamp, I do find personally that whatever fixation you use, as you put the drill through, what you're worried about is that not keeping that position. So That's I, mean, why I you personally... Uh, for me, I, I'll just try and see if it's reduced. If there's any question about it, is just to clamp it, but but just don't overly overly clamp it. And also, just beware when you're putting it through the uh, on the medial side that you're not too close to where the saphenous nerve is. Um, so basically, look to try and see if it's reduced. If there's any queries or it's a really severe syndesmosis injury, then 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 do so uh, but uh, just always have one on the side and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to start a case unless I had an appropriate size clamp for the amount of soft tissue the patient had. Okay fantastic all right let's move on to the next cases. So, 
So this is a it's very interesting case. Uh, it's one of the few that I have seen in the hundreds of CTs we have of the postromalgia fractures. So this one has a obvious tibialis posterior entrapment within the fragment of this fracture. Uh, would would this change your approach of how you how would you approach this, uh, Andy? So uh, I think with this it means that you're going to have to fish this out now um, these obviously aren't the bone images but it, it, it's either a, a very large type a or there's an undisplaced type b where the the, the fracture between the, the two parts of the posterior malleolar fracture isn't uh, um, uh, uh, hasn't gone fully through but but with this really you, you've got to do the medial uh, uh, the medial postural medial approach first of all so you can go in through the retinaculum leaving a small cuff so you can get a nice repair uh, uh, afterwards but you can fish this out and then just make sure that there aren't any any uh, particular tears in to post if there are i'd just debride them and retubularize if necessary but if, if that isn't fished out you are not going to get this closed up so you'll be able to fix that at that point and it's then a question just as uh, as uh, lynn showed on that other case that we did together before is that um, you if you felt like you needed to have some fixation over the lateral side, actually you can feel that it, you can put your finger all the way across the back of the tibia, um, check that you can feel that it's reduced and that it's a really easy shot uh, to just uh, uh, go normally between the sural nerve and the perineal tendons, fire a wire across and put a four millimeter cannulated screw across. I, I think that's the, that's the essential bit as well for this, Andy, is the fact that if you don't see the tendon. And if you try to fish it out from this side and just try to flip it out, you will miss if there's a tear. So if you if you do have a tear, you're not going to be able to see that tear and and, and make the uh, obvious repairs that require to do to do so. So I 100% I agree with you. Okay, so this this is an unknown entity, uh, which is comminution, and this is the bit that really is uh, an ongoing question at the moment. So what's going through your head when you look at this? So when I look at this, I think that we've, we've lost something. So we've got comminution here. So yes, this one's not even that bad, uh, that displaced. And obviously you don't know the full story uh, until we have the axials. But you can see here, we have small little fragments of comminution as this is uh, impacted. This, this also truly shows that this is not an avulsion fracture. This is an impaction injury. This is, this is why it's a rotational pilon. So how do you think that is going to affect the results? Does it change how you approach things to how the cases we've shown before? Yeah, so we, we went back through this. So, the, so there's two papers came out year, this year from other units showing that um, having a, a diaper and frag when actually uh, uh, worsens your outcome. And then uh, we, one of our medical students went back through our JBGS paper. They the, uh, looked at uh, who had diaper and shares and whether or not that changed their the scores that were given. And you can see here that, sort of that there's a significant difference between uh, both on the VASCO and the OMAS is that with a die punch, we dropped it enormously. So we certainly are still on the learning curve on this one. Uh, but for these, uh, the, the, but the problems are is this, is obviously you can't see the joint. Uh, you can't see the insura because you have the, you have your PITFL and then your perineal artery over the top. And then as we know, the radiology has limited use. Um, this one uh, specifically, the, we removed the fragments. These fragments were not reducible, and obviously the incarcerated fragments stopped the reduction. So these were re uh, removed. But I do find with this compression screw, you really have to be careful because if you over compress this after you remove the fragments, what happens? You get an incong incongruent joint. So would you have uh, a fully threaded screw then, or do you still prefer to use the partially threaded? So, no, good question. The reason why we used partial thread on this on this one um, was to because uh, we didn't have a fully threaded screw. But uh, I'll show with the next case now is that if you can reduce it, uh, actually having this plate with the screws distally as raft screws, so bringing this plate much uh, further down and using them as raft screws uh, is a lot better. It's a lot easier then. Um, so. So this one is, as you can see, is a much larger fragment. So this one is, is reducible. As we brought the plate a lot further down, 
we can use them as raft screws. And this one has a, this, this fragment has not been removed as previous. So we do use wires around the plate to hold the reduction until you get the plate on? Yeah, that's what I usually do. I usually get the wires right uh, uh, subarticular to keep that fragment in the right position and then bring the, bring the plate down. Same with any, uh, most die punches around the ankle, so anterior, posterior, uh, you generally open the book, bring the fragment down, close the book, and then use wires uh, to hold that fragment as you close the book before you uh, put the plate on. I think this, it, it, I mean, you've got the screws in a perfect direction there, but it, it also points towards another, um, something which I think is really important for all of these, these fractures is that you need to really um, try and get the screws uh, parallel to the joint. It, it, it's very easy uh, to have the, uh, the you know, your wire, say on a standard 2A or 2B, going, uh, going from uh, distal to proximal. So as you do whatever scrub, even if you don't over compress it, is that you'll find it will elevate your, your fragment. So I think trying to make sure that you keep your hands, uh, you move your, your hand towards the head so that you're going parallel with the joint means that you're not going to lose the, 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 the good position that you've achieved with your hands, holding it with a ball spike pusher or periosteal elevator or whatever. And if, and if, you, if you are naturally going uphill, so if you put a, uh, a plate on the top of it, it does uh, stop it progressing approximately. Uh, but we, we found that quite a few times right at the start of this, when you, when you do, did it uphill, you got that compression and then it suddenly just moved up and you lost that reduction. So one thing that I found is that when you, when you have some of the bigger fragments, for whatever reason, it's actually easier to open the book so you can get the fragments out or to push them down. Are there any tips that you've got for if it's uh, 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 a smaller uh, 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 fracture in, in length ways. So, so I, you, you can either go from the top end, if it's a wider fracture and it, you are able to get to it by the medial posture medial, you can get the frac fracture fragments from the medial side, um, or you can go transfibular and get the fragments through the, through the fibula itself. Uh, we'll talk about this one now as an as a example of that one. This one's a, is, was different to the others in that it's got, this isn't really a type three fracture, but it's broken in two bits. So obviously it's plastically deformed your posterior profonde and then fractured uh, behind it as well. So really it's a type three fracture, but with a large die punch. And this is a, is a nightmare because it's, it's how do you approach it? Because you can't really approach it through the medial side. So this is what spurred me on to start doing transfibular approaches really. Uh, it's an example of this one. So, so you can see that I've, I've put an osteotome through the, uh, through the fibula fracture. And then as I've impacted this, then I've been able to bring it down back to the joint level. And then I've, uh, uh, as so, I've, uh, I've fixed it a wire to keep that in position before putting the plate on. Yeah, so I think one of the things that you're say, saying there is that for, compared to the one before, which is not a reasonable size chunk, but it's not extending right into the midline as that one is. And it's very difficult to get that from the back, isn't it? Is that I think you would just, you would tilt it or you'd be having to press it so hard is that I'd worry that you'd crush the back of it and nothing at the front. So I think trying to get your position is very, very difficult for, for a true die punch fragment like, like this. Well, uh, yes, there's yeah. any questions for these ones? Yeah, so... Uh... On the topic of fixation, um, you've shown some, we briefly touched on that. Some people I've seen or use partially threaded screws, a combination of plates and cannulated screws. So what, what's your preference here? And does it really matter if we were to use a fully threaded screw or a cannulated? I, I know that you said over compression might be a problem, but can you? So it's good, good questions. So, so when people come back to clinic, if, uh, we, we got a kind of general clinic. Um, I can look at the x-ray and know that I haven't operated on them. I usually can know who's operating them because we all have our signature moves, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my signature move is generally a, um, a small 
uh, plate uh, in an anti-glide position initially. I'd put a, a partially threaded screw to compress and I, to prevent it migrating if my position is not right, as Andy said earlier. And then I would complete it with some further screws around it to, to lock its stop rotation. So that's my signature move. Um, and that's because I, my personal feeling is I like a compression across a joint and I like an anti-glide to start with. And then I add another one in to prevent rotation. Um, what, what, what's your feelings, Andy? So um, Lyndon has slightly more patience than me. Um, I think uh, previously, is, especially when we first started doing this, there were no plates that fit on the back. And it can be a bit of a pain between them and then bending them a lot and, uh, uh, and things. Uh, when I very first started trying to fix these, is there were no plates that fit on the, uh, on the back. So we just got used to using screws. I think as uh, things improve with regards to anatomical plates, is that plate, if a plate can help with reduction, uh, and uh, maintaining that reduction, it is better to use. I don't think pull-out strength, I think, is, is, is that important because once it's fixed down, I think these unite pretty quickly. But I've tended to use screws in the past, although my practice is changing at the moment. And do you use partially threaded screws as well then? Yeah, I would tend to use partially threaded screws. As I said, it, it depends what availability you have of four millimeter fully threaded screws is that we don't tend to have them. So it really is a, a, a case of, if it's one of the ones where you've taken out those sort of small fragments, is really, you just want the, the head touching the, um, uh, 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 the, the cortex. What you tend to find with these is that if you if you try and do it like sort of you are fixing a subtalar fusion where you're really cranking that screw in, especially if the fracture is like three weeks old, is that that head will just sink into the bone or it will split the fragment. Is actually you're trying to hold this in position with either a ball spike pusher or a, a, a Langenbach or a, a, a periosteal elevator. And then the screw is just, is just holding it there. You need to have your reduction first of all, and then fire as many wires as you need to in that without splitting it and then put your screw in. And that's just to hold it once it's in the position. You're not really trying to crank it. Uh, now, just a quick question, one from Sarang Kasturi. Uh, any situation where you would use a syndesmotic screw instead of a tightrope, and do you think screw would do better in situations where you have used two tightropes or required two tightropes? So I, my personal viewpoint of that, as we said before, is if you need to control it axially, um, I think you need to have at least one screw in there. I think sometimes in elderly patients, especially if they're uh, osteoprotic uh, or even just locally, it feels like it's significant osteo, uh, osteopenia, is having some transtibial fixation, especially if there's a medial injury, I think will prevent it going into, into valgus afterwards. I think as Lyndon showed with the, uh, with the second syndesmosis case, is having the two tight ropes, uh, there isn't any evidence for this, but it just makes me feel quite happy if you've got them going in divergent directions that hopefully you'll get it seated with the incisura. What do you think, Wendy? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, if, if you're thinking that it's, you're looking at a super construct, so you're worried about either you've got comminution or you're worried about a, um, a, a fragility, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a, a, a tightrope. But I would use a tightrope if I'm not worried about those. And I've got a young patient, for example, you want to try and maintain some movement. Um, getting divergence, I think uh, it's a theoretical benefit, but it's, it's, you, you then control in both anterior and posterior, uh, both translation and rotation. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on. I think uh, we've got probably time for two more cases, if we can. Yeah, so because so, this was a above and beyond uh, posture malleola um, talk, I've added this one in, which was a rim fracture, uh, which is a bit of an oddity, uh, but not only that, as you can see for the CT, it, it is a very large fragment, but it's due to works of how do you approach this? How do you get to this bit? Um, I know how I approached it. Andy, how would, how would you approach it? So uh, I, think, I think with this is that you, you, um, you're gonna need to be able to flip this down. So I'd probably use a posture medial approach. Uh, on this, you might be able to go medial, posture medial. I'd need to look through the whole of the, the whole of the scans, really. But I think the key is is that you need to be able to 
uh, actually probably medial posture medial and uh, posture lateral approach I think looking at the uh, there and you need to be able to open the book and flip that round now one of the problems here is this the the the, the medial fragments at the back is if you're going to fix that is you can see the discoloration of the tibialis posterior groove so you you can't have anything in that because it will impinge it's really tight in adherence as you go there so the medial posture medial approach will allow you to flip the uh, 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 tibialis posterior over uh, um, the front of that that cor the, 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 the corner and then you're going to need to fix it so if i was going to fix it it it, uh, it would need to be with a headless compression screw i must admit i don't particularly like the plates that sit down in that because i'd just be worried about them abrading it to the others posterior and you're gonna be in all sorts of trouble there uh we're trying to perform a reconstruction if there was uh, a problem and also if you needed to go in and debride it because it was tendinopathic in that area i think you're going to find that the anatomy will have moved around quite a bit and your chance of neurovascular injury would be increased and yeah we we're singing from the definitely from the same song book on this one so you're so I'm exactly your, your tibialis posterior, which is going to be lying here, is over this this interval of where your fracture is, and essentially you can go both ways with the medial posture medial, and that's that's the way I did it, and I agree with you. I did a, a headless compression screw to ensure that the uh, any um, it wasn't anywhere near your tibialis posterior tendon, because I agree with you. Anything that goes down that groove, I'm very very worried that it will um, that they will uh, irritate that tendon. Okay, so if we, we do this as our last case, and then we can go to comments, really, uh, this next one. Um, so here we've got a, 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 a rather sporting fracture. Um, I think that's quite the biggest one I've seen. Um, so how are you going to approach this? Because when we look at this, you think, do you go front, do you go back, do you go somewhere in the middle? How, how are you going to approach this, and in what order? So for me, this is a, it's, yeah, it's, it's the highest one I've ever seen in my practice. Um, you know, the most extensive approach we have is the medial posture medial. So when you get about one molar square above your uh, tibial profond, it, it, you can see all, the entire back of the tibia. So from there up, essentially, you can see the entire back of the tibia through the medial posture medial portion because it's, it is your medial um, extensile approach for... Um, so if I show that, it's your medial extensile approach for your uh, compartment release. So it's it's very safe as an approach. You can see your uh, saphenous nerve and vein just in front of it, but it, you can see it all the way all the way up. So for me, this one is much, it's very easy to approach from that to get your apex in and get some compression across. And then your anterolateral fragment, so you can see on this is a is a straightforward anterolateral approach. I would tend to do the the top bit first. Um, just to get my length, because that, that uh, makes it much easier to get your uh, anterolateral fragments down. But you just have to be aware, don't to put anything from the back to the front that might stop your reduction of the front. Because uh, it's very annoying if you if got the patient in that position, put the uh, uh, back to front screws, and then you can't reduce that, and then you have to go back to the, to the initial fixation. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Is that what you want to do is we originally taught if we like say true peel on fractures is you want to make sure you've got a constant fragment. And it's so much easier to do that by keying in the top of that bit at the back, and then you know how what position you need to put that uh, uh, anterior part in. Um, so so what position would you have the patient in for this? Uh, so uh, this one was a um, the uh, recovery position prone to start with to do the back, and then I've turned the patient much easier to turn the patient from that position to a supine position than it is from pro prone to supine. But I've done it through the back and turned the patient. So if you just put the patient prone, you can do that, but you're going to rapidly fall out with your anaesthetic department. As oh, yeah. sort of uh, reiterated at the start, is that you're in a sort of in a lateral, the upper body is almost in a lateral position, although the bottom of the body is in a prone position. You can very easily take the lateral and just flip them onto the side. So doing both, both of them, and you can get to them easily, and the anaesthetist won't hate you forever for doing it. Yep. And that's uh, 
So my signature move, as we found out earlier, of an anti-glide plate and a compression screw, and then completion of the plate has been done both front and back. Uh, he done very well. This was his six week uh, um, uh, x-rays. He was uh, from over the water and you can see that it's not quite uh, healed at this point, but he was doing very well at this point in out of a boot. Okay, well, I think um, we'll probably call it a day with the, with the cases there, if that's okay, Yasser. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an amazing uh, lecture. Uh, not only did it cover all of the you know, possible scenarios that we could possibly have, and not only helpful for FRCS, but also for, you know, I think, pragmatic daily approaches to these fractures. So thank you both very much. Um, questions about positioning, as we talked about. Now, an approach. So if you do have a uh, 2A type of fracture, large lateral, possible lateral, uh, but you have quite a long or a comminuted fibula fracture, do you then do a posterior lateral approach and make separate windows for your fibula fracture or, or do you have uh, something else? Yeah, so I, I, can, I can start with this one. So I tend to look at the fibula, look at comminution and know my, um, how difficult it is to fix the fibula through that approach. So I'd much rather do a, a, a direct lateral and just do a posterior medial approach. When you do a posterior medial, you will see your uh, posterior lateral fragments. It's pretty straightforward. So I will, I will tend to a, a separate lateral and then a posterior medial. I, I will tend to do that slightly differently. It depends on the size of the patient, but if they're of a reasonable size, um, I think that you can, you, you, can, you can actually do a posterior lateral incision, but the posterior lateral incision I'll do will, will be between the Achilles and the Sural. Uh, because you say you only need to make quite a small incision for these small type 2a fractures and you can fix that and then you can do your direct lateral so depending on what the morphology of the patient is is quite often i'll get the uh um, you can actually almost do this in a lateral position get the foot up on a, on a big black block so that the leg remains parallel you can do your postural lateral incision you can go and fix that one fragment and then uh it's very easy uh, uh to do your to do your fibula um Lyndon's special doing things upside down than I am. <laughs> um, thanks. And then on the, when we mentioned about the, the compression of the posterior malleole as well, quite a lot of times there is the comminuted uh, area which is missing, so you can't really actually assess. How do you assess over compression then? Are, are, do you have any tips or tricks to say so will prevent over compression? So I think one of the ways to, is to look at the apex. So that apex needs to needs to be uh, needs to be needs to be keyed in. So if you've got say a ball spike pusher or peristal elevator, whatever you're using to compress it, don't put it right down at the most inferior part of the fragment. Is try and put it sort of in the centre where normally there hasn't been a big bit which has gone out, and put your wire across. And I say it really is just getting the head of it to touch the cortex, no more than that. Do you do anything different, Lyndon? Or? Yeah, no, it's, it's similar. So you know, your initial reduction has to be at the apex, because otherwise what you do is you tilt into the defect. So you have to be at the apex to keep that defect open, really. And then when you are putting your screw in, uh, do under x-ray. So when you when you get in down to the bottom, before you start to tighten it, do under x-ray. Because I, I have personally done it before. You over-tighten it, and you can see the, the fragment do that. And then you, you get essentially narrower uh, tibula profonde as you do the tailors. Um, so it's more uh, get them last few turns on an x-ray. Okay, and then last question here. Uh, on case four, what happens in, in case four if, uh, to the plate if you remove the screw and leave only the tightrope through it? Will the plate rotate? And uh, if you remove the screw, usually you're removing it at about 12 weeks. Uh, you know, my lecture last year said that you really shouldn't be removing these screws before that. Um, and if you are removing the screw at that stage, you'll tend to have uh, enough fibrous uh, over that plate that it's not going to rotate. Okay. In that case, you could have quite easily used two screws as well. All right. I think uh, that's that. Thank you both very much. Uh, as I said, a fantastic uh, series of cases here, which are uh, uh, amazingly helpful to everyone. Uh, thank you both. Uh, and... Uh, we'll see you next week uh, at um, on the 27th 
for the next uh, BOFAS Lectures of Distinction uh, series. Okay, so stay, stay tuned. Uh, good night. <laughs>